Frequency separation is a powerful retouching process in Adobe Photoshop, and it goes way beyond being utilized for skin retouching. It can be an artistic process that transforms an unedited image into a piece of art. Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. I'm David Bird with Reality or Imagine, and we can now finally begin the journey of frequency separation, which is my favorite retouching technique in Adobe Photoshop. It can certainly be utilized to retouch skin, but I use it to go way beyond that, to use it like a traditional artist to paint the image, to repair things like wrinkles in clothing, wrinkles in the background, and it goes even beyond and further with that. It's a wonderful retouching process, and I'm excited to start sharing it with you here in the retouching series. But before we dive into the Photoshop, I would like to ask for your help in growing this channel on YouTube. Liking this video and subscribing to the channel lets YouTube know and the vast audiences know that they can find great content here and great education in photography and in Photoshop and beyond. So please consider liking and subscribing. And when you subscribe, make sure to click the bell icon because then you'll be notified when new videos go live to this channel, especially continuing the journey of frequency separation and retouching in Adobe Photoshop. So thank you so much for your support. And now let's dive into the Photoshops and begin the adventure of frequency separation. So in the previous video, we had explored the healing brush, the spot healing brush and the patch tool and how those tools use content aware to simply make up something new to cover up a blemish. And we use those tools retouching the image directly instead of using a process like frequency separation. We found that the clone stamp tool does not do a very good job when you're retouching directly to the image because it doesn't use content aware. It just does a straight copy of whatever you select. So we need to use something like frequency separation with the clone stamp tool because that's actually the premier tool you would use to retouch the skin during that phase with frequency separation. So today's video, we're going to populate the layers for frequency separation. Then we're going to use the clone stamp tool and start working on the detail layer. We'll talk about all the layers of frequency separation and then how the clone stamp tool is truly the premier tool to use during this retouching process in Photoshop. But before we populate the layers for frequency separation, I do wanna do one more demonstration of content aware and ultimately repair this image for another problem that we can see, which is right now on the left side of the image, we can see that the gray seamless paper ends. We can see the pulley system for the paper and then the white wall of the studio. So I want to use content aware to fill in this area and make up something new, sampling a little bit of the paper as we go. Now I'm using a, Adobe Photoshop CC 2020, which is a part of the Creative Cloud program with Adobe, where it gives you access to Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Lightroom, and Adobe Bridge, all for $10 a month. I am not sponsored by Adobe. I've just had a subscription to the Creative Cloud for a very long time, and it's something that I constantly recommend to people, especially when I'm teaching. So you might want to consider that Creative Cloud subscription because you'll have access to the most current versions of the program. In Adobe Photoshop CC 2020, there is a new dialogue for content aware fill that gives you a lot more control over what the algorithm is going to look at to sample something new. And that's what I want to demonstrate. So we need to make a selection of that area that we want to repair. And to do that, I'm going to use the polygonal lasso tool by hitting L. And then I want to make a selection that goes outside of the document because I want to make sure I'm getting all of the edges inside. And then I'm also sampling just a little bit of the gray paper because Photoshop will potentially use Use some of that to kind of make up something new in that selection. So once I have the selection made, we'll see the marching ants of the selection itself. We need to go to the new content aware fill dialog and to go there, we'll go up to edit and then down to content aware fill and then click it. This will take us into the dialogue. We can see our selection here. This is what we want to fill in. And then anywhere that's painted green in the image, this is Photoshop's way of telling you it's going to source from this to make up something new. Now we can see that it's also potentially sourcing from the model's clothes, and that could be a problem because it could introduce some of the textures from the clothes, some of the highlights and shadows and so forth. But a way to tell is to look at this side of the screen because on this right side here, Photoshop is actually giving us a pretty good view, a live view, if you will, of what it's going to do once we actually complete the process of content aware fill. And I think it's done a really good job. So I don't see any uh, lines or colors or anything that would indicate that it's pulling from the model's clothes. So at this point, I think everything looks fine. But 
I do want to demonstrate how you could remove some of that selection option within the image. So right now, if we look at the brush, we can see that it's a round circle with a little minus sign in the middle. That means the brush is in reductive mode. So now all I have to do is click where it's painted green and it will take away the green. And then it will rethink, resample, Skynet will do its job and then it will fill in the area. So potentially if there were some issues it was bringing from the model's clothes, that would undo it. We can even go one more step and just go right to the perimeter here so that we can make sure that there isn't any green that is coming onto the model and sampling potentially some of her clothes or her skin for that area. Once all of that's been done and it's thought about it, it's still thinking, it's circling, it's circling, we're chasing, we're thinking, and we're done and now we're moving, we're gonna go over to OK and then hit it. And then now Photoshop has filled in this entire area with that selection and it looks fantastic. So to get rid of the active selection we see on the screen, the marching ants, I'm going to hit Control or Command and the letter D for deselect and now that's gone. So let's go ahead and flatten this, which means we are working destructively because what happened with the content aware fill dialog is that it filled in this blank layer with that new material that it's made up. And so now since this layer is on top, it's covering up our initial bottom layer where we can see the background of the studio itself. I wanna merge these two layers together and I'm going to do it where I'm working destructively. I'm gonna come up to layer, and then down to flatten image. You can also see here that I have bound the F4 key to flatten image because I flatten all the time because I tend to work destructively for my own personal projects. But when I work for a commercial company, I work non-destructively. And I'll explain what that means here in just a moment. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit flatten image and flatten it and push it down. You know what, let's explain that right now before we get into frequency separation. Working destructively means that I essentially cannot go back. Right now I have, I believe I've set my history slates in Photoshop to be to 100. So if I were to hit Control or Command and the letter Z, I could go one step back in my history. So if I decided, mm, you know, I didn't really want to fill that area, I wanted for some reason to see the studio space, then I could go back. If I work destructively, I can't go back. So once I've moved on in the process, I populate the layers for frequency separation, I do some painting, a whole bunch of different stuff, I'm going to have moved more than 100 steps forward. And then once I've done that and I've gotten to 101, I cannot go back where I just flattened it. That means I cannot undo what I did. So when you work, and especially when I work for a commercial company, I work non-destructively. I try to merge layers onto their own layer. So I have the original layer still in the layer stack if I need to call back to them. I save various versions of the living document as I work so that at any point, if I'm working with an art director and they say, hey, we need to make this change and this change to the images, I can simply go back and make those changes. If I work destructively, I may not be able to go back. And if I can't go back, then unfortunately, I have to do the whole thing all over again. And that's can be tragic depending upon the job. So that's a little lesson in working destructively and non-destructively, but for today's purposes, working destructively is just fine. So we flattened it and now I'm going to come up to my actions window and run the action that was created for frequency separation 16-bit. Now, if you don't know how to make these layers or to make an action, there just happens to be a video on this channel that explains to you how to make the action and a current action for the updated version of frequency separation, which is to use median noise instead of Gaussian blur. So check out the videos by looking at the link above. So I'm going to go ahead and click the action and make sure we're on it and then hit play. It's going to populate all the layers. It's going to give me a message that's a stop in the action telling me what to do for the next step. And then I'll come up to filter noise median. And then we need to make a selection where essentially we're going to blur out the pixels on this layer, but we need to still be able to understand the outline of the subject. We want to be able to tell the delineating lines between like her eyebrow and then the eyebrow ridge in her skull or skull and then coming down into her eyelids. We need to see all of that. But we want the details to be blurred out just enough so that we have a pure color layer to work with. So at this point, I think it looks really good. I'm gonna increase it to six pixels and it's making everything much softer, but those lines are getting just a little bit blurry and that could potentially be a problem. So let's go back to five pixels, not six. 65. That's way too much. But this is a great demonstration to see 
right now we can't really make out anymore what her eye looks like or the eyebrow or the nose and so forth so this is why too high of a pixel count is going too far we still need the structure of the image or the subject within the image itself so i'm going to select all of these and then hit five pixels that's a much better view and then i'm going to hit okay and then now we just need to continue the action once media noise has been run and to continue the action we just hit play and it will continue beyond and populate all the different layers so Let's consider this video for a deep dive into what frequency separation is as far as an explanation of these different layers, and then we'll get into the clone stamp tool and start repairing some of the skin. So frequency separation simply means that you're going to be separating the details within an image from the color and put them on separate layers. Why is that important? Well, in the previous video where we demonstrated using the healing brush by healing brush patch tool and the clone stamp tool, that's using Photoshop's algorithm to sample the area that is made up of detail and color. The algorithm tries to merge those together to make up new skin or something new, whatever you're retouching within your image. As we saw in that video, it, it does a good job and it can work just fine in that regard. But the algorithm can introduce artifacts along the edges where the pixels just don't match up where the colors just don't match up. It can look splotchy and nasty and bad, almost as if it's a blemish within itself. So if you're trying to just repair blemishes or, or tough skin pores within an image of a person, you can potentially introduce new issues as you're trying to overcome those existing ones. Trying to match the color was a little difficult sometimes. So all the different reasons in the world why the algorithm is a great thing. Skynet is wonderful as long as you're not John Connor. However, it can only go so far. It can't just be a one-click option to fix everything. Frequency separation gives you the ability to selectively control where the colors are and how you're applying them, how you're mixing them within the image, and the details themselves. What details you're copying and moving over. So by having the details separated to this layer here that says main detail layer, and then we have our color layer here, which is main color layer. We can work on the color and paint in new colors, mix the existing colors on this layer. If we use the traditional basic brush, we can paint in new colors on this blank layer that says paint on this one. If we paint in new colors into the scene, we're painting it on this blank layer here that is above the main color layer, but below the detail layer. So as we paint colors here or use the mixer brush, hint and spoilers for a future video for the series, mixer brush here on this color layer, the details are preserved. They're not going to be covered up. If we were to just paint directly to the image itself, we would be covering up the details. If we sampled some of the existing colors, used the basic brush and started painting on the image, we would cover up the actual texture of the skin, the actual details. Here, since it's on a layer that is beneath the detail layer, the details are protected and preserved. So we have great control over the color itself. For today's video, we're going to be just using the clone stamp tool and working on the detail layer. But in the next video, we're going to use the mixer brush. And the mixer brush is a wonderful tool to use to blend some colors into the scene. And in the video after that, we'll use the basic brush and do some painting and show you how to augment the image from there. So let's get to the detail layer itself and start working on it. With the detail layer here, one of the things that the action populates is a black and white adjustment layer, which is at the top of the layer stack. This helps you to see the details because it's forcing you to see the image as white, black, and gray. It removes the color from the scene. Now, the colors have not actually been taken out. They're all right there in the image and they're fine. If we turn off this black and white adjustment layer, there's the color. This is just simply an adjustment layer. It does nothing actually directly to the image. It's just turning it black and white for our field of view. Once we're done with the black and white adjustment layer, we can turn it off or we can delete it. This is another example of working destructively and non-destructively. If this was on and we accidentally flattened the entire layer and saved it, we cannot go back because if we close the document, we don't have access to our history. So I'm going to leave the black and white adjustment layer on. I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit. And I wanna show you what the detail layer looks like all by itself. So I'm gonna turn off all the other layers, but leave the detail layer active. And to do that, I'm going to hold Alt or Option and click the eye icon for the detail layer. When I hold Alt or Option and click it, it turns off all the other layers so I can see just this one. 
When I want to turn all the other active layers back on, I just hold Alt or Option and click it again. So when we look at the detail layer here, we can see all of the fine details within the image itself. Let's zoom in just a little bit more. We can see the skin texture. We can see the pores, the eyelashes, and so forth. And this is why it's so important to separate the details from the color because we can just move details around wherever we need them to be. We can move around the, the stronger pores or bring in different skin texture over the blemish if needs be. But if we look right now, the blemish is like what, right here-ish? Let's see, let's, let's turn all these layers back on. It's right there. But when we look at it from the detail perspective, we can't tell. We cannot tell the difference between this skin texture right here and anywhere else. So with frequency separation, again, having the freedom to work selectively between the details and the color, we have understood now that this blemish really is just color. It's not detail. It's not a problem of the detail. It's just the colors. And it kind of makes sense if we think about it. Now, this requires us to get potentially a little gross and ugh, but let's just think about it. A blemish is a three-dimensional raised section of skin. So when the light from the studio strobes hits her face, one side of it's going to be brighter, one side of it's going to be darker because it's a three-dimensional object that comes forward. So in this case, yes, the texture is there, but if we were to adjust just the colors, the blemish would go away instantaneously. And that's something that we're going to demonstrate in the next video when we use the mixer brush. But in this field of view, let's go ahead and look around and see if there's any bits or pieces of skin texture details that jump out at us. And I'm not really seeing too much, but as I look like right here on her eyelash, this is a section of the eyelash that's just a little bit brighter than the rest. And this is where I can use my analytical mind, my artistic mind to say, do I want a specular highlight, something bright to appear on an eyelash? No, because eyelashes are black, they're dark. They shouldn't reflect the light unless there's some very interesting design that's been done by the makeup artist to the eyelashes. So this is where we can use the clone stamp tool to do a straight direct copy of texture from one part of the image over this and cover it up. So I'm gonna hit S for the clone stamp tool to activate it. I'm gonna use the left and right bracket keys to make my brush bigger or smaller. And I made my brush roughly about the size of the thing that I want to replace. And then I'm going to make a sample selection telling Photoshop to make a literal copy from this selected area to cover up that little part of the eyelash. So I wanna do it somewhere nearby because again, even though we're doing frequency separation, we need to work in the same zone of whatever we're retouching. So I'm going to hit Alter Option and I'm going to put my mouse just right above that little highlight right about here. Hit Alter Option, tap once. Now Photoshop knows I want to copy that area directly over this blemish. And then I'm going to use my Wacom Intuos pen and touch the tablet and just gesture back and forth to make sure that it has done a full copy of those details and have covered up that little part of the eyelash itself. So as we police the image and we zoom around, we can look at it in this view, but it's potentially difficult to see. So at this point, I do say that it is much better. And this is usually how I start frequency separation when I'm working on the detail layer. I leave all of the layers active. I just did it this way so you could see. So when I look at it, I know that some of these are potentially could be blemishes or could be stronger pores and texture that need to be retouched. Also, it could be the color underneath. So when I work on this, the first stage, when I'm working on an image doing frequency separation, I will use the clone stamp tool. I will be in a view just like this, and I will try to go through and undo any strong texture. And then I will go into the color layers to work with those to complete the process of retouching the skin. So as for the clone stamp tool, I'm going to hit alter option to make a sample area selection within this same zone on her forehead. Let's make one mm, right there. And now that I've tapped it once, I made that selection, I'm just going to start tracing over new details wherever I think there might be an issue, like wrinkles in the skin, lines. Lines and wrinkles can be caused by the makeup, uh, blemishes potentially, or it's just some stronger pores that could stand out that could be you know, retouched or removed and lessened just a little bit. So we'll go through some of these lines and again, just kind of try to match it up. And as I start to get over into this shadowy, 
region on her face because again this left side is much brighter this is a little bit darker i may want to move my source from the clone stamp tool so instead of keeping it over here somewhere i'm going to bring it over to this side of the image alter option to sample that area now photoshop will start drawing from that and why did i move it well Potentially it could be a color issue, but more importantly, it could be a focal length issue. This texture looks pretty strong, and so it, it's pretty much matching, but keep in mind that if her head is turned just a little bit away from the camera, I'm gonna hit Control or Command and the number zero to zoom all the way out. Right now, it, it's arguable that her right side of her face, camera left, is closer to the camera. If she were to turn her head and continue to turn it away, where the left side of her face is turning away, those pixels on the upper right side, upper left side of her left side, right side, what, what's the right side? I don't even know anymore. So let's say for camera side or document side, the upper right corner of her forehead that we see right now, our right side, those pixels could be a little softer than the pixels on the left. So as we work in the same zone of the forehead, we also just want to kind of stay within that same focused region within that zone, just to make sure that the details match up and that the focal length isn't too wonky. So again, alter option and just looking for different little bits and pieces to remove potentially. And this is where, again, with the black and white adjustment layer, I can see some pores that are a little darker and I can see pores that are a little brighter. And this is where I have a chance to simply introduce softer pixels, softer skin tone that will minimize that. So if we think about it from a luminosity perspective, we have highlights, we have some pores that are darker, that's the shadows, and then we have pores that are in the gray area, which is just like midtones. So we can kind of copy those over if needs be. So when you work with the clone stamp tool, and you get proficient with it, you can just go very quickly. It's something that you need to be cognizant that you don't retouch too much or introduce recognizable patterns of skin texture. But ultimately, it's something we can just do like this. Alter option, sample, and tap there. I'm just moving my selection as I go because I don't want the same repetitive pattern of skin texture to show up because that creates a repetitive pattern where our eyes can begin to analyze and go, wait a minute, I keep seeing the same five or six little pieces of pore texture that keep reappearing all over that region. That's a problem. We don't want to introduce distractions for the audience that's viewing our image. And again, I would just go through an image like this, this way. I would go almost this fast. I would be listening to some music or an audio book or thinking about the next video I'm going to record to the YouTubes and all that fun stuff. And I would just sit here and retouch skin texture going this quickly and looking around the image and going, mm, do I see some more strong pores or anything that might be a blemish? Yeah, we'll go right through here. Let's look at the original blemish that we retouched. I'll come down here and just move some texture over it. And there's the control of the texture. And again, you know, the healing brush, the spot healing brush and the patch tool did something similar, but we've just put in new texture that's almost identical to the existing texture, but we didn't move any color because we're only working on the detail layer. And the detail, the color layer will be a wonderful, easy, quick fix when we use the mixer brush to move some paint and colors around. Now we can just move around the image and scroll around. Quick little side tip, a uh, quick little note for Photoshop. Any tool that you're using, I'm on the clone stamp tool. When I want to move the image around so I can see it, just hold down the space bar and that will turn any tool into the hand tool so you can move the image around in the dialogue. When you let go of the space bar, it will go back to the tool you were using. So this is a great way where I can stay zoomed in and I want to stay zoomed into the image at a good distance where I can still see the poor texture, but I don't want to zoom in like this because this is just not a realistic view of working with the image. Sometimes it's okay. To zoom in all the way if you're doing very fine detailed work when i'm doing commercial work it is not uncommon for me to zoom in to the pixel level where i can see the individual pixels where i can come in like this especially if i'm like removing potentially veins in the eyes or capillaries or whatever i can come in and just start copying actual pixels over and making a fine-tuned adjustment just like that it's not uncommon when i'm doing commercial work but it's not recommended to be zoomed in this much. So uh, controller command and the minus key will zoom you back out in even little stages. This, uh, that's a little far out maybe. This is a pretty good view that works for me. But you know, it's, it's up to you. Find a field of view that works for you. And if 
you feel more comfortable being zoomed in all the way down into the pixel level, that's fine. Just make sure that you're being efficient with your work. Uh, there's many different instructors and teachers and influences in our industry that have said over the years that ultimately sometimes done is better than perfect. And that's up for you to decide with your work and your retouching process. I take pride in the work that I do. And sometimes I do spend too much time agonizing over small little details within the image or choices that I've made artistically. But uh, I do try to keep in mind the output of the work, where it potentially is going to go, and uh, its an effect and impact and its reflection upon me as an artist. So we've policed the image pretty well in all the details. And again, we're just looking for fine little details and pores that can be adjusted just a little bit by using existing pores in the image. We're not completely destroying the pores or the texture. We're not making up something new. And there are tips and tricks and ways of using things like grain or noise to make up new fake skin texture. And that is definitely something that we will explore later on in the retouching series here on YouTube. But ultimately, it's one where if you can use real pixels, real information in the image to just repair or overcome, that is always a better choice than trying to use something fake or something that just simply doesn't match the realism of it and it's again it could be a source of pride it could be uh, better results it, there's a lot of different factors there's been times that my work that i provided to clients they love it and initially their expectation was to print it let's say as a 20 by 30 wall portrait and that seems fine so some of this you know careful little detail work that'll be fine on a 20 by 30 print but then i get you know a call that says hey we want to make this a really big print we want to i'm going to use this image i'm a real estate agent and i want to blow it up on a billboard and i'm like that's great i need to do a whole bunch more retouching to the image because when that is blown up to be that big you're going to see a lot of errors. So again, as I work, I try to be efficient, but I also try to make sure that I protect myself from the billboard headshot that could ruin my day. So this point, I think we've demonstrated enough of the tool itself and how it can be used in this initial stage. Even as we look right now at this level of view in the image, we can still see the blemish because the blemish is color. In frequency separation, because we separated the details and the color, color is what needs to be addressed. And that's precisely what we're going to get to in the next video. But let's take a step back and uh, recap what we've talked about. So again, we have used the frequency separation process, which separates the colors from the details, the details from the colors and puts them on their own layers. That gives us tremendous control to retouch skin, but to go way beyond that, to begin to augment the paint within the image, the color within the image, begin to draw focus potentially to certain areas within the image, and ultimately sculpt this image as a traditional artist would with their painting. We use content aware fill to overcome the issue of the studio space where we could see off the paper and see the studio wall by using the new content aware fill dialog that is unique and new to Photoshop CC 2020. If you don't have access to the newest version of Photoshop, consider getting a Creative Cloud subscription where you get access to Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Lightroom, and Adobe Bridge, all for 10 bucks a month. So Thank you so much for watching this video today. And again, help us grow this channel on YouTube by liking the video and subscribing to be made aware of new content that comes to the channel. And until next time, I'll see you out there in the world of Photoshop.